So uh, thank you to the organizers and to everyone for this wonderful conference. Um, the chapter I contributed is the focus of Lobs and Gyatso, this prominent uh, Tibetan scholastic and his critiques of what he thinks are the uh, faulty sort of epistemological and logical grounds of brain science. Um, but for my presentation, just in light of our conversations yesterday, I thought I would talk about sort of a broader social historical context for that debate, since we're not all generation specialists and so on. Although in light of the previous presentation, now I wish I had just kind of done it. <laughs> it would have been an interesting pairing, but anyways, it's in the, it'll be in the written chapter, so uh, just bear with me here. Um, so this morning I'll introduce some of my research into Buddhist scholastic engagements with scientific empiricism between the 18th and 20th centuries along the inner Asian frontiers of the late Tsars and Qing empires. And then during the nationalist and socialist revolutions up until, uh, in the case of the Tibetans, their kind of long exile post-1959. Uh, and in this current project, I am trying to understand why most of our scholarship on Buddhism and science and technology reproduces, not troubles, binaries in the humanities and social sciences between the West and the non-West, between the modern and, and tradition, science, religion, progress, stasis, rationality, belief, self-ownership and other ownership, and a, ver a variety of other historicities that Webb Keen usefully labels the moral myths of modernity. And so my work is turning to what I call counter-modern Buddhist engagements in inner Asia. These actively rejected, or else remain consciously illegible, to rationalizing processes tied to the West and driven by technological mastery over human life and environments. What new historicities of Buddhism, or sorry, what new histories of Buddhism, I ask, emerge by looking at the shadows, not the shining exemplars, of progressive nationalist and modernist Buddhist actors and ideas that always already seem legible to a rationalist West? So let me just introduce, just broad scope here, way beyond what I can get into in this paper, four broad eras, I guess, of critical engagement amongst these inter-Asian kind of go-betweens along the Siberian, Mongolian, and Tibetan frontiers of, of Europe, China. Um, so the first is a sort of what I see in this new book project is the 17th to 18th century era of contact and relativization. And I, I should say, I think you would see those specialists in Japan and those working in South Asia, you'll see probably parallels with, with what's going on in, the, uh, in, uh, in, your, uh, in your area. So 17th to 18th century period of contact and relativization. And for the inter-Asian monks, uh, this is really tied to Jesuit presence in uh, the kind of late name, but specifically the Qing. A 19th century period of engagement and hybridization. Here there's direct contact, especially driven by Protestant missionaries, uh, the British, but American increasingly, uh, uh, contact in Eastern Tibet and in Mongol lands, uh, and the Mongolian Siberia with the Orthodox Church, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church. An early 20th century period of defense and attack. This is the collapse of the empires, the rise of nationalists, and then socialists revolutionary movements, um, uh, wherein Buddhist scholasticism, of course, is on its heels, right? Uh, and uh, in the case of Mongolia, suffers horrendous erasure. And finally, a late 20th century, hybrid, a period of hybrid embrace and attack, uh, having to do in this complex kind of mosaic of monastic reforms, the Mayan Life Institute, say the leadership of the Dalai Lama, of trying to drive conversations that many of us are familiar with, as well as though, and it's often underlooked, I would say very sustained attacks against the presumption that science and using community in contact. There enters Lobe San Gyatso, the focus of my chapter, but I'm gonna kind of just provide some of the background here uh, in the few minutes that I have. Okay. And I'll do so not having to do with brain sciences, the focus of Lobe San Gyatso's attack, but having to do with something familiar across the Buddhist world, the problematic uh, assertion that the earth is round, which really becomes the face of scholastic engagement with empiricism, European technology, and so on for two or three hundred years. Um, okay. So in an undated essay published posthumously in 1997, the eminent Tibetan monastic scholar and education reformer Zina Rinpoche, up here in the top right of that picture, addressed an issue uh, that for centuries had vexed Buddhist literati along the inter-Asian frontiers that I just described. 
This concerned the scandalous proposition that our world is round, attributed in the 18th, 17th and 18th centuries to heretical um, Chinese literati and Indian panditas, but actually arriving in, uh, in the hands of the Jesuits to China. Um, as we all know, canonical sources record the Buddha describing in some detail and on multiple occasions, the world is flat. And unlike uh, familiar debates in the early modern history of religion and science in Europe, such incommensurable representations of the world, whether attributed to the Buddha or to Copernicus, were not in fact the problem for Zime Rinpoche, nor for the long debate and encounter that he, uh, he weighs in, uh, in 1997. The issue for Tibetan and Mongolian scholastics over the last two centuries concerned not the world, but how we know it. Using his famous gifts for poetry, Zime Rinpoche begins by arguing that in any legitimate religious or scientific inquiry, quote, actual investigation is like a jewel appropriate to clasp at one's heart as if it were one's heart, end quote. And so with analysis and not faith in hand, Zime Rinpoche confronts what he sees as two erroneous positions held by his monastic tradition. One, that a round earth is even debatable in light of the sort of technologically enhanced uh, evidence, uh, empirical evidence. And two, that the undeniable roundness of the earth can be proof of the Buddha's ignorance. Regarding the empirical evidence, Yimei Rinpoche writes, quote, established on the basis of direct perception and Munsum in Tibetan, the world's discerning knowledgeable ones assert unanimously that the earth is round. If one disagrees, this is a clear sign of the fault of one's own reasoning or foolishness. And I couldn't help but have a flat earth. <laughs> uh, from the internet. Anyways, he continues. The Charvaka materialists denied the reality of phenomena uh, unperceivable to the senses, such as karma and rebirth. However, even they uh, would never dispute the reality of something perceived directly by the senses. senses. But how did the Buddha describe a flat earth, thus contradicting the evidence of science and of observation? And to answer this question, Zime Rinpoche employs several of the dominant interpretive strategies that I see in this sort of 200 year engagement with science uh, that I'll mention briefly in a moment. In the first place, he writes, neither monastic scholars nor scientists have direct access to the contents of the Buddha's mind. Furthermore, there are many possibilities as to why statements on the round earth are absent in the Buddha's recorded teachings. Perhaps the, Buddha, the early Buddhist community failed to record them. Uh, or perhaps the Buddhist teachings on the round earth uh, were recorded but never translated. Perhaps they lay abandoned, buried somewhere along the Silk Road. Or perhaps the Buddha may have given such teachings, compatible with contemporary science, in another country, another time, another body, and in, an, in another language. So dispensing with this view that the Buddha's silence on a round earth is proof of his ignorance, Zimei Rinpoche then turns to another of the major interpretive strategies that I'm noticing was employed for generations of his scholastic uh, predecessors. And this is to relativize scientific knowledge that challenges accepted doctrinal positions, uh, whether these are considered to be provisional teachings of the Buddha or definitive ones. Oh, even if the Buddha mentioned something in the sutras, it did not necessarily exist. For example, he sometimes would say that a person is truly existent when, of course, they are not, or that Mount Meru is both round and square. And even when he was questioned on such disparities, he said that both exist and do not exist." End quote. The world appears differently to ants and elephants. A person appears differently to his friends and enemies. And worlds appear differently uh, and thus exist differently, dependent upon the theoretically limitless karmic and perceptual positions from which they may be known. And on this note, Zime Rinpoche concludes this short 1997 essay, contented that he had valorized the undeniable reality of the world uh, known by scientists in the West, without undermining the finality of any conventional, sorry, by undermining the finality of any conventional knowledge that we might hold. So we might accept or not accept the philosophical uh, kind of uh, argument here, but I'm more interested in the social history of the terms and why in the first place this monk in 1997 felt compelled to set ink to pay to paper. Okay, so anyways. And for this I go back to what is, I think, a formative kind of ground, uh, kind of creating, groundbreaking uh, uh, text, which is from the 18th century. 
uh, that provides the interpretive terms, I say, for uh, this long engagement with technical knowledge from Europe. Uh, and this comes in the 17th century and concerns this figure, um, I don't have an image for unfortunately, Sinter Kempovich of Heljorp, be familiar to anyone working on Inner Asia, um, and a letter exchange he had with the Panchen Lama of Losan Yeshe. Uh, and this a letter exchange, uh, which um, is preserved in an 800 folio uh, text, uh, uh, explores and debates a series of contentious issues in Sufa Kempel's previous histories. Uh, these included things as diverse as the actual cause of Chinggis Khan's death, the historicity of King Gesar, sort of the King Arthur of Inner Asia, for anyone that's familiar, and most importantly, perhaps, the shape of the earth. So that we're back here in the, in the 18th century. For example, in one of his previous uh, geographies, Simpo Kempo took serious account of newly emerging Jesuit publications in Chinese on heliocentrism, Copernican astronomy, and state-of-the-art European geographical knowledge uh, already being embraced by the Qing courts. And the result was really revolutionary in Inner Asia. In Simpo Kempo's work, Germany, France, and St. Petersburg, never before known in Inner Asia, were mapped onto classical Indic cosmologies and, for, for example, the Kala Chakra. More problematic was Simpa Kempo's synthesis of Jesuit narratives about the Arctic Circle, a previously unheard of part of the world where the sun either never sets or never rises. And herein, herein lay the controversy. As the Jesuits already knew, to account for these cycles of Arctic sunlight, the world had to be spherical, not flat, and also the planets uh, and the sun needed to be in orbit around one another. Well, I guess the planets around the sun. <laughs> uh, this caused an explosion in frontier Tibetan and Mongolian scholastic circles um, that could only be quelled by the supreme authority of the Panchen Lama, who wrote a series of widely led kind of public edicts on how scholastics ought to encounter science. Um, so let me just skip forward, though, because I'm aware that I'm probably going to run out of time. I don't want to rush. Um, if we go forward, this is a sort of period of relativizing uh, um, newly emerging kind of scientific knowledge. And importantly, there's no direct social, political, or economic threat to monasticism. This is the point. These are ideas floating through translations, interesting to be uh, a debate amongst these sort of cosmopolitan monks. They can be relativized in various ways. Things change dramatically, as I explore in my recently published book, uh, first book, these things change dramatically uh, in the early 20th century when laws are being enacted to limit scholastic education, where prominent scholastics are being tried and shot in Mongolia and Siberia, and where in the kind of privileging of scientific development, socialism, Soviet kind of socialism, is increasingly erasing scholastic life. Here we get into a very different sort of terms of engagement in this uh, tradition of uh, this long conversation. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, so, uh, one way of just jumping into this very briefly here is a letter exchange that I explore in my first book between Abu Andorjiev, um, some of you may be familiar with. He was a the philosophical tutor of the 13th Dalai Lama. He was a confidant of Tsar Nikolai. He was in Britain. He was a real go-between trying to preserve and sort of uh, maintain the autonomy of Tibet and Mongolia in the wake of the Qing and Tsar's class. Um, he's also a prominent Buryat reformer uh, as well. And in a letter exchange I look at in my, in my book, he writes to the protagonist of my book, Dalla Dandan, this prominent abbot in Hakka, Mongolia, uh, during the revolutionary period, with a series of eight questions. And the one that concerns us most here uh, sort of reveals how central this question of empiricism mapped onto these old scholastic binaries between direct and inferential cognition, and we even saw in the previous presentation from old canonical sources. So Agwan Dorgia says, writes almost desperately, especially nowadays in, in our region, many people re reject the existence of past and future lives. They accept as valid knowledge, right, as a prominent of the same up in Svetna Kimchi and Mongolian, only direct perception, but not inference. If we can overcome, perver overcome perverted views such as these, uh, held by those who do not accept rebirth, it's possible that they might once again become Buddhist. Uh, and I should say, sorry, that this is from 1920, oops, 1927, so anyone that knew so Soviet history is up to date will know that this is already becoming a very unhappy time um, for 
uh, even for an early era of revolutionary leaders, many of whom were monks, by the way, in Siberia and Mongolia. Uh, anyway, so he's asking for, to Zawa Damdin back in Halka, in Ulaanbaatar, for, for help. Zawa Damdin at the time refuses to answer, at least in that letter exchange, but if you look at his prolific historical works over the course of the 1920s and 30s, he takes many, many occasions to attack the uh, um, kind of the, uh, technologically inflected knowledge about the world, specifically as it has to do with the round earth. For example, this is from his the Altan Defter, the, the Golden Book, the Serki Defter of Tibet. So when non-Buddhist barbarians use their many different instruments to explore all over the world, it's not necessary that they see by means of the direct cognition in the same way described in the sutras and tantras. This is so since many of them are obscured by karma and our Buddhist presentation that's returns given to them. This is what leads the you know, this is what leads uh, superficial intellectuals from Europe to use their instruments to describe the world as being shaped like an egg, in other words, as being round, and is continually rotating. They actually, actually believe that they can perceive this. And this reminds us of the sort of the 18 blind people describing um, the elephant. So these sort of debates and polemics are familiar across uh, the late colonial and post-colonial Buddhist world, of course. Um, but I just wanted to say, in reference to this, this longer tradition going back to Slipper Kempo, in the revolutionary period, accommodating science, competing forms of scientific knowledge and accepting technologically enhanced knowledge about the world uh, was unacceptable. In fact, it was a, literally a matter of life and death, and all of these people were killed, actually, in the revolution, as it turns out. Uh, but allow me just to sort of jump forward to sort of a, a more recent uh, uh, period of accommodation and uh, um, uh, I guess relativization, and this is really the Gavin Chopel for you who studied Inner Asia knows is another example of someone that engaged these ideas. I'm going to skip across that and come to what I actually write about in the chapter, which is which is this fascinating figure, tragically murdered figure, uh, unfortunately, but uh, uh, fascinating example um, from uh, the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, both in Gatso. So in 1992, this famous uh, monk. Uh, who was working in Dharamsala and in fact trained a certain generation of Tibetanists and Buddhist study scholars at the School of Dialectics before his death, uh, broke from the already developing uh, uh, openness of the Dalai Lama to scientific uh, knowledge. Um, and Lopsan Gyatso wrote a stunning 100 page attack against the epistemological validity and logical consistency of the brain sciences, basically. This is what I look at in the chapter. Um, this is called uh, The Foundation of Permanent Happiness, a Compendium of Excellent Examination into the Structure of Conditioned Existence. So his work develops a complex polemic attack against the so-called, what well, he sees as the logical inconsistencies of scientific materialist positions that claim audaciously audaciously, for example, that anger, attachment, and other mental phenomena could be made up only of subtle atoms, like dual chop, chop in Tibet, and the, the equally audacious scientific presumption that perception can be reduced to so much meat, bones, and electricity, somehow witnessing ponds, sands, and sunsets. Uh, right. Um, Sorry. At the end of Losan Gyatso's attack, um, is the, uh, which uses Dharmakirti's prominent of Artica and so on uh, against scientific positions on the brain sciences, we see what I see as like a fourth kind of radical leap in this long kind of social history of knowledge engagements in scientific empiricism, which is that Losan Gyatso moves from logical attack to experimentation. Um, he conducts controlled experiments in his monk cell to substantiate his views that the mind must at some level be immaterial. He's mimicking, therefore, very consciously so, with uh, the proof so prized in the scientific method. And he does so here specifically um, by placing a horse tail, you know, horse tail, in a bowl of water. Uh, and then observing over the, over the course of days that without any other material cause, nothing's been added, nothing's been subtracted, insects begin to be born in, in the water. 
I mean, I think microbiology was a little off the charts for him, right? But this is actually doing experimentation, right? Also, else, or he says, we can actually observe this, he exclaims. Another experiment that we can kind of pull out of his text is that he has a, so three sentences, uh, is a, he has a control, so a few, just glasses of water and then a few other glasses of water sealed. So it's sort of a control, uh, a, a experiment of control. And leaving one jar unsealed, um, he describes observing the latter, the one that's covered, becoming full of insect eggs, even though um, none could be observed entering the water as if on the wind, he says. So all these examples, and the details are in the longer chapter, uh, represent popular, perhaps even dominant, um, late and post-imperial Buddhist projects to reject scientific knowing and the rationalization of the public sphere in ways that I suggest were common, perhaps even normative, across Buddhist Asia. Yet the forms of religious, social, and political imagination that arose from such reject rejection remain vastly underrepresented in what are now substantial subfields like Buddhism and science, technology, Buddhism and medicine, Buddhism and modernism, these scholarly subfields, right? And so I, I encourage us, us to think together about not only what is made visible, but what is made invisible when we think Buddhism and science or technology together. Thank you.